Hi, my name's Jamie, and I'm a postgraduate researcher at the University of Exeter. I'm looking at new species which are arriving in the UK, but how much do we know about the species that are already here? Everyone knows that crisps come from potatoes, but how many people know that there are over 8,000 varieties of potato and over 180 species? That's a lot of hidden diversity. Most people, when they think of diversity, might think of the Amazon rainforest, but an incredible amount is also found within UK farms. Warwick is currently a student at the University of Edinburgh and his work focuses on how to protect this farmyard diversity. Hi Warwick, are those for me? <laughs> so what's a bunch of daffodils got to do with explaining farmyard diversity? It's an interesting question Jamie. There's a range of genetic variation across farms all over the globe. Let me demonstrate. You can see all the different flower colours present in these daffodils. It's this variation which allows us to breed farm animals of all different shapes and sizes within the same species. So why is this so important? It's this diversity which allows us to breed farm animals for a range of different production environments. An interesting example is the North Ronaldo sheep, which survives almost exclusively on a diet of seaweed. But these breeds are also important for our cultural heritage and often reflect strong regional identities. We've also selectively bred farm animals for higher yields. This is no more pronounced than in the dairy sector, where you can buy a pint of milk for less than a bottle of water in some cases. So what are you working on right now? There are over 8,000 different farm animal breeds, but many of them are largely unprofitable and threatened with extinction. This is because their need for largely natural feed and longer rearing times makes them unsuitable for modern intensive agriculture. How can we help these rare breeds? That's where economics comes in. We can pay farmers subsidies for conserving rare farm animal breeds to take stock of this important diversity for future generations. Through economics, we can better understand how to allocate subsidies across farmers to make sure rare breeds don't go extinct. Thanks for it, that sounds really important. I'm glad that somebody's working on this. So of course, dung from livestock is one of the key pathways connecting us with the soil, passing in important nutrients and fertilizers and making sure we can grow enough food. But how have changing agricultural practices affected life beneath the turf? Melanie is currently at the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. She's scratching the surface on this hidden habitat. Hi Melanie. Hi Jamie. Oh, I'd rather not get dirt on my hands, thanks. Oh, that's not just dirt. This is soil. It's home to so many different animals, worms, insects. And I study microbial communities. Microbial communities? A microbial community is made up of all the organisms that are too small to be seen, like bacteria and fungi. This bit of soil can contain more than a billion of bacteria, and they support a lot of soil functions. So what kind of functions are we talking about here? Uh, for example, they support plant growth. They live very close to the roots and provide the plant with nutrients, and the plant, in a kind of teamwork, provides the bacteria with their carbon sources and they also degrade a lot of stuff below ground. You could just think of an underground recycling company for free. Just have a smell. It smells like when you go walking in the woods when it's wet. Well, this compound is geosmine and bacteria release it to communicate with each other. We can detect this geosmine or other compounds to detect what kind of species is in the soil. And we also can use those compounds for pharmaceutical products. This is another reason why it is so important to keep the microbial diversity alive and protect our soils. They can also prevent uh, floodings, because unhealthy soil can store much more water. 
And that's really important, isn't it? Because with climate change, the amount of flooding in the UK is going to increase. Definitely. Thanks, Melanie. Thank you. We're now going to simulate a heavy rainfall event using this water balloon. In a second, I'm going to throw it over the edge and we'll see the water slowly filter into the soil where it will eventually end up in the nearest watercourse. Let's try it. Anya is studying the tiny creatures which live in fresh water, and particularly the Thames, working from the University of Reading. Hi Anya. Hi Jamie. So, what have we got in this river then? Am I going to catch any fish? Well, there'll be a few, but that's missing a bigger picture. There are millions of other organisms in this river. Some of them are plants and some of them are plant-like creatures. We call them algae. They need light and carbon dioxide to produce food and oxygen. And collectively, they produce almost half of the world's oxygen. Naturally, algal communities are very diverse. But given the right conditions, one species can develop a very dense population and take over the, the entire ecosystem, spoiling the environment for everyone else. So kind of like an algal bully? Yeah, kind of. Scientifically speaking, we call these processes algal blooms. And the pollution from fertilized soil, for example, can fuel a rapid growth of these species. So how could we tell if this was happening here? Well, we can take a sample of water, analyze it in a lab, and the species that we find in it will tell us a lot about the health of this ecosystem. So shall we go have a look then? Let's go and have a look. Right, Jamie, I've prepared the sample for you today. Would you like to have a look? Yeah, let's have a peek. What can you see? Well, I can see a tiny creature swimming around and some green blobs in the background. Well, the creature is a rotifer, it's a tiny animal. It's smaller than a pinpoint. And in fact, it feeds on algae. And it looks like while I, whilst I was preparing this sample, it ate almost everything that we wanted to see. Oh no, <laughs> does that mean that grazing is an important factor for controlling these populations in the wild? Yes, it is. It is important in oceans, seas, lakes. But in rivers, the current will not allow these animals to establish very strong populations to control algal growth. So there are more important factors to consider. So using these and other factors, can we predict where these blooms are going to happen? Absolutely. There are mathematical models that do it for the um, oceans and seas and lakes. And I'm currently working on one that helps to predict algal growth in the River Thames. And of course, nearly 20 million people live near the Thames, so that's got to be really important research. Absolutely. We've found incredible amounts of diversity all around us. Rare farmyard breeds, rich soil communities and tiny aquatic organisms. But this incredible diversity is also very fragile. In our changing world, where the future seems increasingly unpredictable, now more than ever, it's important that we protect our delicate diversity.